Okay, well, I guess we'll get started then. So good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Dan Eichberg. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm one of the six year neurosurgery residents at the University of Miami. Uh, and today I'm gonna to be talking about uh, two projects that I've been working on over the last year and a half uh, with Dr. Ivan along, as, uh, as, uh, along with some of the other University of Miami uh, researchers. Uh, first, I'm gonna be talking about um, my project in glioblastoma invasion. And then second, I'm gonna be talking about um, our fatty acid oxidation uh, nanoparticle dual therapy uh, treatment project. So I'm um, starting with GBM invasion. You know, one of the things that's always amazed me about glioblastoma is how invasive it is. So you can do a super maximal resection, meaning that you resect the enhancing part of the tumor, and then you resect normal brain around the enhancing part of the tumor. And no matter how much normal brain you take, if, eventually there will be a tumor recurrence. And that's because the cancer cells have migrated or invaded far beyond the borders of the normal, of the enhancing area of the tumor. So it just, uh, it, it's a real and intractable problem. And you don't really understand why it is that GBM is so invasive. Um, so that's sort of the reason that we did this project today. That and hopefully to be able to find and leverage a treatment focused on uh, GBM invasion. So basic science talks are often challenging to listen to because they're often an alphabet soup of different proteins and receptors and things like that. So I'm gonna make two promises to you this morning. The first promise is there's only one protein that has a weird name and that's CD97. So you have to know CD97, but that's it. And then the second talk is I'm gonna, or the second promise is I'm gonna to try to make this um, as straightforward as possible because um, I want everybody to sort of understand what's going on. Okay, so GBM or glioblastoma is the most common and most fatal malignant brain tumor in adults. And the reason that it's so deadly, there's two reasons it's so deadly. Number one is that the cells reproduce so quickly. The second problem is that it's so invasive. So this tumor on the right is an example of a well-marginated tumor, meaning that it does not look very invasive. It has a smooth round border. Um, you can imagine that if you take out this tumor, uh, it won't necessarily come back because you can get all the cells. On the left, you see these tentacle finger-like projections. And this is an example of a very invasive tumor edge. And uh, this is what glioblastoma looks like under the microscope. So it's very, it's very invasive. And so there's these two issues with glioblastoma, cell proliferation and invasion. And all of the treatments that we have for glioblastoma today focus on the proliferation, they target the proliferation of glioblastoma. So temozolomide is an alkylating agent that targets the new DNA of dividing cells. Radiation therapy targets and damages the DNA of new dividing cells. Um, so everything is sort of focused on these proliferating cells. But the issue with glioblastoma is it's a very heterogeneous cell population. So it has different populations of cells doing different things at the same time. So some of the cells are focused on dividing but some of the cells are focused on moving around and invading and, and uh, migrating. So those migrating cells aren't necessarily dividing. <clears throat> so if you have these treatments that are killing all the, the dividing cells and they're sparing all the invading cells, once the treatment stops, eventually the invading cells will wanna you know, settle down and um, move in and start dividing themselves, then you get a tumor occurrence. So we really don't have any treatment for these invading cells at this time, or and we don't understand why they're so invasive. So um, let's talk about CD97. This is the, the only protein whose name you have to know. Um, CD97 is a, a cell surface receptor. It's from a new class of cell surface receptors that have been discovered called adhesion class G protein coupled receptors. And what it is, is it's basically like an antenna that sticks out of the cell and detects what's going on in the extracellular matrix, like the environment that surrounds the cell. So it's able to sense the presence of other cells, proteins in the extracellular matrix, vibration, things like that, and transmits this information back into the cell and lets it know what's going on. Um, so in basically the only cell in normal healthy tissue that has CD97 is lymphocytes that uh, basically use it to extravasate or go out of or migrate through blood vessels to go into inflam inflamed or diseased tissue. So it's sort of like physiologically used to invade through something to go somewhere else. We also know that um, C97 is important in invasion and metastasis in other kinds of cancers throughout the body, um, you know, colon, 
breast, things like that. It hasn't really been studied in the brain that much. One other thing that we know is that C97 is not expressed in normal neurons or normal glial cells. It's really only expressed in glioblastoma. And the amount that it's expressed depends on the WHO grade. So glioblastoma, which is WHO grade four, expresses the most, grade three, less so, grade two, less so, and then grade one. I, I believe it's, it does not um, uh, produce C97. So that's sort of the background. So, um, you know, we took a look at a database called the Cancer Genome Atlas Database. And this uh, basically looks at survival of all different patients that have been genetically sequenced. And we look for differences. And we found that patients that have higher than normal levels of CD97 actually have a worse survival than patients that don't have an overexpression of CD97. So, um, you know, that sort of furthered our interest in exploring CD97 and glioblastoma. So um, at, at UCSF, Dr. Safai uh, took a look at U87 GBM cells, which is a commercially available uh, GBM stem cell, or sorry, GBM cell line. Um, and what they did was they knocked down levels of CD97, and then they plated the cells in a dish, and they measured how quickly and how far these cells invaded uh, in the dish. And they found that when you knock down CD97, there's less invasion. And while this is interesting and promising advice or promising results, uh, the issue with U87 cells, anytime you see an experiment, a GBM experiment with U87 cells, you have to be skeptical because these cell, these commercially available cells have been in circulation and have been reproducing for about 50 years. So they're actually completely genetically dissimilar to real glioblastoma cells. They're not even genetically similar to human cells at all. They're this sort of, you know, mutant freak uh, that, that it's, it's very difficult to take any results with U87 cells um, at, at face value. So, um, you know, we wanted to sort of look into this concept, but repeat it with actual patient-derived glioma stem cells. So, um, you know, whenever, whenever you're doing a, a, a glioma surgery with Dr. Ivan or Dr. Komatar, you know, often we're sending tissue for, uh, you know, scientific experiments and things like that. And you don't really see what goes on afterwards. Um, you know, does it sit in a tumor bank? Does it get thrown away? It actually gets used for um, experiments. So it goes to our lab in Lois Pope and we uh, take the, the, the tissue and then we do a number of different steps and we separate the blood cells and the immune cells and we purify the glioma cells and then we grow them, um, grow, grow them up. So this able, enables us to do different experiments. So um, thanks everybody who's ever sent tissue for this. Uh, so what we found when we take the glioma stem cells and purify them and grow them out of um, different glioma patients is that when you, when you rank them according to the level of endogenous CD97, as you can see over here, so from left is the highest level of endogenous CD97, and then to the right is the lowest level of CD97, um, there's sort of a correlation between levels of CD97 in the cells and how uh, sort of subjectively aggressive their invasion patterns look. So for example, um, this patient GBM22, when, when you took out the tumor, it had a recurrence all the way in the contralateral side that was non-contiguous with the original tumor. Um, uh, these next two high, high C97 patients have like aggressive butterfly gliomas that are crossing over the corpus callosum. And then you know the one on the right that has uh, the lowest levels of C97, uh, it's still invasive, but it's sort of more local regional invasion. Um, that's sort of a, just a quick and dirty ob observation that people haven't really, people haven't really correlated radiographic uh, invasion patterns with C97 levels before. Um, and then what happens when you do an invasion assay in vitro? So basically what we did was we put these glioma stem cells in a uh, special chamber um, that was separated from a bait chamber, which contains serum that cells love. And they they want to go towards the serum. We separated those two chambers with uh, a substance called matrigel. It's just kind of a barrier that makes it difficult for cells to move. Um, and then we measured the time it took for the cells to go from the initial chamber to the bait chamber. Um, and we, we call that value uh, of time that it took the invasion rate. So we, we can also see that the cells that have the highest levels of C97 endogenously um, invade the quickest, and those that have the lowest levels of C97 uh, invade the lowest or invade the slowest. So um, you know, we pu published these results, uh, which were exciting. The, you know, but of course, this is 
sort of correlation, not necessarily causation. So to do uh, causation, you have to do an experiment. Um, so our experiment was genetically modifying the amount of C97 in these cells. So we wanted to artificially decrease the amount of C97 and then artificially increase the amount of C97 in these cells. So to decrease the amount of C97, we used um, shRNA, single hairpin RNA, that targets C97. So basically it's an RNA that we make that gets put in the cell and then finds this, the RNA that's supposed to make C97 and then destroys it before the protein can get made. And that results in a lower level of C97. And we, what we found is when we do that, when we lower artificially the amount of C97, we see a decrease, a significant decrease in uh, invasion rates in vitro. Uh, similarly, um, when we overexpress the C97 levels, when we add C97 connected to a promoter that is very active and we make the cell just churns and churns and churns out C97, we see a statistically significant increase in levels of invasion. Um, so, you know, we, we thought that these results were interesting and, um, you know, we wanted to kind of keep delving further. And so, but the question is, um, is this enough? Is just saying that C97 is bad and then we should make an inhibitor of C97 uh, and, then, and then use it in people? Is that, is that enough information at this point? Um, no, because C97 is a very complicated uh, molecule with different subunits and receptors. And we have to really understand exactly how each subunit is working in order to make a drug that'll um, focus on executing a therapeutic benefit. You know, maybe we want to uh, remove it entirely. Maybe we want to stabilize it in one conformation over another conformation. Um, we just need to know more information about the structure and mechanism of, of this protein. So, um, so this is on the left, this is a picture of CD97. As I mentioned, it's membrane bound, sticking out of the cell membrane. So there's two main subunits, or two, not subunits because there's many subunits, but there's two main sections of it. There's this membrane bound C terminus fragment, CTF, that's stuck in the membrane and won't leave. And it's loosely connected to this N terminus fragment, this NTF, very loosely connected. So what happens when CD97 gets activated is that something that, an, a ligand that activates it, for example, another cell that's floating around, uh, a protein in the extracellular matrix, vibration, it binds to this N terminus fragment, and then the N terminus fragment gets excited, so it pops off and floats away. And this causes the membrane bound portion of the C97 to get activated, and then it causes downstream signaling within the cell. Okay, so there's uh, two things. The NTF, that's the other, I guess, the only other abbreviation that you need to know for today. The NTF pops off, floats away, and then the C97 gets activated. But it's a, it's a little bit more complicated than that because you have the, the C97 activation in the cell that contains the C97. That's called in cis signaling. So things happen to the cell that has that receptor and it gets activated in cis. But then you have this free floating N terminus fragment that floats away or the NTF that floats away. And it can do a number of other things. It can get broken down. It can bind to another cell and then activate that other cell. Uh, to do something uh, like invade, or it can cause it to release other chemical factors, things like that. So just a lot of a lot of different things are going on, and we need to figure out which one or ones of them is causing or could be contributing to the in vitro invasion that we saw in our previous experiments. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna bring this up, this sort of hypothesis or idea up in your, in your minds to kind of help organize the rest of the slides. Uh, for our in vitro results. So this, this is just a very, very interesting observation that we made. Uh, so we were looking at, um, you know, mice brains after we injected glioma stem cells. And we noticed that when we look at blood vessels, so this is a cross section of a blood vessel. This is the wall and this is the lumen of the blood vessel. And what we notice is that in the perivascular space surrounding the blood vessel, we're seeing a, a large number of these NTF, the N-terminus fragment, that thing that pops off and then the C97 gets activated, we see a large number of this protein fragment floating around. We don't see any cells floating, floating around it. And you know, we know that the perivascular space is a very common place for glioma stem cells to migrate along. So, you know, is it is it possible that the N-terminus fragment is acting as a, a chemokine, a chemoattractant that says, come here to the uh, glioma stem cells? Um, uh, that that's sort of the kind of framework of, of an idea of an idea that we're working with here. Um, so to 
further understanding of the different subunits of C97 and figure out which one to target, uh, to, you know, eventually try to make a drug against. We cloned a number of different constructs sort of playing around with C97. So we basically, so every construct has a fluorescence, um, uh, fluorescent protein marker to like let us know that the DNA that we created was actually taken up into the cells, um, either green fluorescent protein or red fluorescent protein. So we made an overexpression, oops, we made an overexpression uh, construct that has a strong promoter for C97 and just the cell turns out the C97, uh, as well as a knockdown, uh, sorry, a control for the overexpression. We made a C97 knockdown construct, which um, makes an shRNA that targets and destroys uh, C97 and lowers the amount in the cell. We also made a control for the knockdown. And then um, we also made a uh, deleted N-terminus fragment or delta MTF, what we called delta MTF, that is both constitutively active because C97 is always active when there's no N-terminus fragment. Um, so, so the receptor is active, but there's no free-floating N-terminus fragment. And then finally, we made a non-cleavable N-terminus fragment. So instead of having that NTF loosely connected to the C97, it's covalently bonded to the rest of the receptor. So it can't be released in free floating. So that means that the C97 receptor can also not be activated. So it's constitutively inactive. Um, so we, we needed some models to test our constructs in. So the first model system that we kind of are validating and helping to develop, you know, we are collaborating with the, um, the, the Zyre Lab, uh, who are experts in creating these um, mini brains. So the, you know, we're calling, you know, so the cells in a dish are in vitro, cells in a mouse are in, in vivo, and we're calling these mini brains ex, ex vivo. So what this is basically is we take, so the, the idea is that when you're working with cells in a dish, there's no extracellular environment. So it doesn't completely mimic what's going on in a patient's brain because it's not just, your brain isn't just a bunch of neurons and glial cells. There's also extracellular matrix proteins, immune cells, um, a number of other things that are going on that the cells have to navigate around um, when, when they're traveling. So in order to make a more realistic human extracellular matrix environment, um, we wanted to create this sort of mini brain model. And the cool thing about these things are they're very small and they're very cheap. So you can do potentially hundreds of experiments very inexpensively and quickly. So and it's important to have a high throughput model like this if you want to test a lot of different drugs. So if you want to test 200 compounds and see which of them target C97, for example, you would want to have this sort of high throughput uh, experimental system. Mice are great, but they're expensive and they take a long time. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's sort of more something that you would test in the later stages after you have a promising compound, but this is sort of a, a great throughput screening um, model. So what you do is you take um, induced human pluripotent stem cells, uh, and then you give them certain growth factors and that sort of commits them to a uh, brain fates. And then they sort of turn into these uh, mini brains. And then you co-culture them with these GBM patient-derived GBM stem cells, uh, which of course we label with um, green fluorescent proteins to able to see them. And you co-culture them together, and then uh, you fix, clear, fix them, clear them, and then image them with confocal microscopy. So this is what a mini brain looks like. Um, these blue cells are stained with DAPI, which is like a nuclear stain, shows the nucleus of the cell. And so the blue cells are basically the mini brain cells. And then these green clumps are, um, green fluorescent protein expressing patient-derived glioma stem cells. So um, this is sort of early on, and you can see that they're just sort of stuck on top of the surface of the mini brain. And then you give them some time, and uh, really interesting what you see is that the cells develop these finger-like projections, and they're actually invading into the mini brain itself. And so the, the Zyre Lab developed this uh, software that is connected to the confocal mi microscope, and it's able to, um, automatically detects how far these cells are traveling from the surface of the mini brain when they travel deep into the mini brain. Um, and that can be sort of turned into an objective number that tells us how invasive, uh, how rapid, how rapid and how aggressive the invasion is. Um, so this is just some, some of our preliminary results. Uh, so we took 
glioma stem cells that are expressing this green fluorescent protein. So this is our uh, green fluorescent protein transfection control. You can see, you know, finger-like projections, lots of cells, looks very invasive. And then when you um, knock down the levels of CD97 with shRNA, you see that there's definitely less invasion compared to the control. And then when you have our um, delta NTF, the the one that doesn't have an N terminus fragment, there's even less, even few, even less invasion, even fewer cells. And then you know you run the numbers using their software, and we see that there is uh, significantly less invading cells. Um, of course, there's also significantly less num total number of cells. So uh, you, you know you might say that the careful observer might say that um, maybe we're detecting less invasion because there's like less cells, and that is possible. But I would say that. Uh, from a patient therapeutic perspective, having less invasion and fewer cells is probably, they're both probably good things. So, um, you know, I, I'm not really too troubled by those, those results. And uh, this is just the next batch of uh, the cells from a different patient, uh, glioblastoma stem cells from a different patient. And we're seeing the same thing here. So we're seeing our transfection control that expresses green fluorescent protein, extremely invasive migrating around the entire mini brain when you knock down the levels of CD97. Um, so remember, we're not knocking it out. There's still some CD97, it just there's less. So you see less invasion. And then uh, over here, when you delete the N-terminus fragment, uh, we see very little invasion in, in few cells. And we're seeing the same statistical significance over here. So you know, clearly, we, we need to continue um, you know, our experiments and do higher numbers and play around with our other constructs. But our preliminary results so far are looking promising. And I think we have a good uh, potential high throughput model in which to test different therapeutic compounds. So um, that's great for mini brains, uh, but you know people really want to know: Does it work in a mouse? You know, before you're going to put something in a human, you have to you have to know if it works in, in a mouse. So this is our in vivo experiments. Um, so what we did was we took our uh, cloned constructs that play around with the different subunits of C97. And we transduced these constructs into different patient-derived glioma stem cells. We grew them out. We selected the glioma stem cells that had taken up the constructs that we made. So the, pure, the constructs that we made also have a pyramycin resistance gene. So basically, if the cell doesn't take up our constructs, it won't have resistance to pyramycin and it'll die. So this is sort of just selecting for cells that have the um, genetic construct that we want. And then we injected these GBM cells into the right frontal lobe of mice brains. And we monitored these mice non-invasively with IVIS imaging, uh, which I'll talk about uh, in a little bit, just to see that the tumor in fact did grow. And then after about 52 days, um, when we confirmed that the tumors had grown with the IVIS imaging, uh, we sacrificed the mice, sectioned the brains, <clears throat> stained them, and then imaged the brains with confocal microscopy. So um, with our results, we were looking for four different patterns of uh, GBM invasion that we see in human patients. So local brain parenchymal invasion sort of radiating directly outward from the margin of the tumor, uh, subarachnoid space invasion, um, perivascular space invasion, you know, cells that travel along the blood vessel walls, and then white matter tract invasion. And we were really focusing on three of these patterns, brain parenchymal invasion, perivascular space invasion, and white matter tract invasion. <clears throat> less so on subarachnoid space invasion. And the reason is because there's a bit of a confounding variable, which is that to introduce these cells into the brains of the mice, um, you have to take a needle and inject it into the brain. And that needle disrupts the subarachnoid space by making a hole in it. So if there's spillage of tumor cells into the subarachnoid space, we don't wanna chalk that effect up to the cancer cells. Um, so we kind of just, at this point, we're not focusing on the subarachnoid space invasion as, as much as the other three patterns of invasion. <clears throat> so um, we found some we found some pretty cool things. Uh, so whenever I show these on these next few slides, the top row is always going to be the relevant control, and the bottom one is going to be the relevant experimental condition. So. You can never just look at an experimental condition in a vacuum. You always have to compare it to a control or the results are meaningless. So this, this is sort of the zoomed out version. So the top row is a control for overexpression. So it's a strong promoter that is causing it to express red fluorescent protein, um, a protein that's not obviously expressed in normal human cells. 
And then the bottom row is uh, overexpression of C97. So it's a very strong promoter that's causing the cell to churn out C97 protein. And when you zoom in a bit, um, you see that when you overexpress the levels of C97, you're having increased levels of perivascular invasion, and you're also having increased levels of corpus callosum invasion compared to the control. Um, so that's sort of the result that we're hoping for slash expecting. And then similarly, when you knock down the levels of CD97 by, uh, well, so this is the control for knockdown. So we're making an SHRNA that's targeting, targeting green fluorescent protein, um, which is a protein that's not produced in normal human cells. So uh, just sort of a control for knockdown. And it also expresses red fluorescent protein as a marker. And then we're comparing it to a knockdown that makes an SHRNA that targets C97 and lowers the level of C97. So, um, you know, again, at the top is the control. And so what we're seeing is that um, there's a bit of a decrease when we knock down C97, there's a decrease in corpus callosum invasion compared to this. I, I don't know how easy it is to see on people's screens. Um, and then also there's sort of a, a decreased local parenchymal invasion compared to um, the control. So this, this is the needle track. This is where the, the cells were um, injected into the brain. So you would expect a lot of invasion in this, this area right here, but there's actually not a whole lot of, you know, there's still some, but there's not as much uh, as we see in the control. And then I think this, this next pair of data is where things get really interesting, in my opinion. So this, this top row is cells that have the, the deleted M-terminus fragment. They don't have that fragment that free floats away. And then um, that means that the C97 receptor is always active. And what we see here is that instead of these finger-like projections, we see this uh, sort of perfect circle. We see a very well marginated tumor border with no invasive finger-like projection. So it looks like there's sort of a complete elimination of local parenchymal invasion. And that was a very striking uh, result for us. Um, in, in contrast, when you look at the non-cleavable N-terminus fragment, this is the N-terminus fragment that can't be released because it's covalently bonded to the rest of the receptor. Um, it, we, we see that there's basically no invasion of the corpus callosum at all. Like not, doesn't look like it's decreased. It looks like there's, there's no, even though there's, you know, clearly GBM cells everywhere else, um, there's no invasion into the corpus callosum. So, you know, this is, these two results were kind of striking for us just as a quick summary. So when you overexpress C97 as sort of is consistent with our overall theme, you get some increase in local invasion, corpus callosum invasion and perivascular invasion. When you knock down the levels of C97 with SHRNA, um, you have a significant decrease in local invasion. And you also have less corpus callosum invasion and perivascular invasion. And then when you delete the N-terminus fragment, you have a very, very significant decrease in local parenchymal invasion. Um, and then when you have the, the non-cleavable, constitutively inactive uh, N-terminus fragment, you have a very, very significant decrease in corpus callosum invasion. So the, the question for us is, what is the connection between, between the N-terminus fragment, which has a constitutively active receptor, and the non-cleavable N-terminus fragment, which has the constitutively inactive receptor? Like you might think that they would have opposite effects possibly, but the, the thing that connects both of them is that neither one of them has free floating N terminus fragment. The Delta NTF doesn't have it because it, it, it was never made. It wasn't, uh, it's been deleted. And then in the non-cleavable, it doesn't have the free floating N terminus fragment uh, because it's covalently bonded to the rest of the uh, GBM receptor, the, the, the C97 receptor. So this, you know, it's a little bit speculative at this point, but we're doing more experiments to confirm this. But, you know, one, one sort of working idea um, that we're under is that this, N terminus fragment that is made from made by C97 can detach and can float around in areas such as the perivascular space and can potentially act as a chemo attractant um, for other glioma stem uh, other glioma stem cells. So we're, we're still uh, looking into that hypothesis. Um, <clears throat> one more one more uh, I guess complicating factor for C97 is that um, when you activate C97, it's not just involved in invasion pathways, it also is involved in growth pathways. Um, so it could have an effect on growth as well. And that could help explain those mini brain experiment results uh, showing that there was a decrease, not just in invasion, but also a decrease in like the 
um, number of cells. So there, the answer is it's, it's a complicated protein with many uh, many effects, and we're still you know trying to figure everything out, but uh, things are promising so far. So just in conclusion for this first part of the talk, um, C97 levels correlate with patient-derived glioma stem cell invasion, both in vitro in cells, ex vivo in the mini brains, and in vivo in mice. When you delete the N-terminus fragment of C97, uh, this may reduce local invasion, local parenchymal invasion. When you stabilize the N-terminus fragment from dissociation, uh, this may reduce corpus callosum invasion. And then the hypothesis that dissociated N-terminus fragment may act as a chemokine and promote GBM invasion warrants further investigation. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna shift gears a little bit uh, and I'm gonna talk about our nanoparticle fatty acid oxidation inhibition uh, project. So, you know, the whole point of cancer treatment is that you wanna take some characteristic of a cancer cell that is very common in the cancer cell, but is not present in normal cells. And then <clears throat> you wanna target that feature. And the better you target that feature, um, the uh, more cancer cells you'll kill and the fewer regular cells you'll kill, meaning you should have less um, off-target effects, less side effects. So um, cancer cells, gl gl uh, glioblastoma cells are very dependent on fatty acid oxidation. I'm gonna kind of delve more into that in a little bit. Um, you know, but fatty acid oxidation is one example of, of that. C97 is another example of that. Um, so, but <clears throat> before I get into our specific results, I just wanted to talk about like what are nanoparticles? I feel like people uh, talk about these a lot. Um, so th these are a really fascinating uh, technological achievement. Basically it's any particle that is between one nanometer and 100 nanometers. And they can be made from a number of different materials, um, polymers, liposomes, um, carbon nanotubules, uh, really, really whatever you want, as long as it's less than 100 nanometers in size. And you're able to um, attach different drugs to it and different other um, <clears throat> imaging uh, molecules. So this, you know, potentially could really revolutionize the way that we treat tumors, as well as also the way that we um, uh, have diagnoses. So just as an example of the potential, th this is not an experiment that we did, but just something that just I think is really exciting. So this patient on the left has a brain tumor and they were given IV gadolinium contrast. And you can see that the brain tumor uh, is enhancing, but when you give this iron oxide nanoparticle contrast instead of the gadolinium contrast, you can see that the, you know, that tumor, same tumor area is enhancing, but there's also this sort of satellite area of enhancement. So, um, you know, different nanoparticle based diagnostics are maybe able to help us understand better where are, you know, are we leaving residual behind? We're just simply unable to see it using, um, you know, current diagnostic modalities. So just, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of potential here with this technology. So, um, you know, kind of cycling back into our specific projects, uh, we were working with the DAR lab uh, here at the uh, University of Miami, and they had created this um, exciting nanoparticle called a PLGA nanoparticle, and that stands for polylactic co-glycolic acid. And uh, this PLGA nanoparticle is very interesting for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, it crosses the blood-brain barrier. So as, as we all know, a lot of drugs don't cross the blood-brain barrier, so it's hard to use them to treat um, brain tumors. Number two, it's biodegradable, so it doesn't just accumulate in cells, and that you know that could potentially cause um, some off-target side effects. And then number three is it has this interesting predilection for the mitochondria of glioma stem cells, and the reason for this is that uh, glioma stem cell mitochondria have a very hyperpolarized um, membrane potential, more so than other cells. So um, they're able to kind of bypass the immune cells that are floating around in the extracellular matrix. They're able to bypass normal normal glial cells and normal neurons, and then they're able to go into the cell membrane and then accumulate in the mitochondria of glioma stem cells, uh, again, due to that hyperpolarized mitochondrial membrane um, technique. So we have these cool nanoparticles. The question is, what do you, what do, you do with them? Um, sorry, what, what do you do with them? So, um, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's becoming more, uh, better and better established that fatty acid metabolism promotes tumor progression, uh, you know, possibly because uh, cancer cells are dividing so much, they require so much energy and fatty acid 
or fatty acids just have so much energy themselves, but a number of nature papers have shown that um, uh, high levels of fat and, and fatty acid metabolism uh, increases stemness and tumor, tumor genicity of a variety of different types of uh, tumors. Um, <clears throat> so maybe we can just eliminate fatty acid oxidation and starve the cancer cells. Uh, well, one, one issue is that um, uh, research have found that when you inhibit fatty acid oxidation, um, these cancer cells have a very plastic metabolism and they can switch over from fatty acid oxidation to glycolysis and able to let them use glucose for energy. So, um, you know, you really, you want to give them a double whammy. Um, you want to eliminate fatty acid oxidation and eliminate um, glycolysis preferentially in these, in these cancer cells. So the DAR lab was able to make these special nanoparticles and they were able to attach different drugs to the surface. So um, they created this dual treatment nanoparticle formulation. Um, so uh, the first nanoparticle formulation, they attached cisplatin to the surface. So we all know cisplatin is a chemotherapy agent. It's an alkylating agent, but it's other well-known effect is that it inhibits fatty acid oxidation. Um, so, and, and then the second drug that they attached was a pro-drug called MitoDCA. So MitoDCA is a pro-drug that eventually uh, inhibits glycolysis. So if you give this dual treatment nanoparticle formulation, you're taking out fatty acid oxidation, you're taking out glycolysis, and then you're basically starving the cancer cells to death. Um, so, uh, and you know, this is where, where we came in and we're collaborating with them. Um, so we wanted to test this, test these, this dual part, dual treatment nanoparticle platform in mice. So what we did was we injected um, our same patient-derived glioma stem cells into the right frontal lobe of these mice, uh, you know, and the, and, and, and the um, glioma stem cells were transfected with the luciferase expressing constructs. Um, and then we waited 30 days and then we, um, to let the tumor cells grow a bit. And then we divided the, the, the mice into two groups. There was a control group in which we in, uh, injected the injected saline intravenously uh, into the tail vein of the mice. And then the second group, we injected our dual nanoparticle uh, cocktail intravenously. So remember that the nanoparticles crossed the blood brain barrier. So we just injected um, this intravenously. And then we waited uh, three weeks and we monitored the mice non-invasively with the IVIS imaging. And then eventually we sacrificed the mice, um, sectioned the brain, stained them, and and did confocal microscopy. We also harvested the other organs um, in order to look for how much nanoparticles building up in the other organs, because uh, although they preferentially target glioma stem cell mitochondrial uh, membranes, you know, we wanna make sure that they're, they're not accumulating in other organs as well. So this is a picture of uh, non-invasive IVIS imaging, which stands for in vivo uh, imaging system. So it's basically able to, it's this, it's this box that has a detector and the detector is able to detect fluorescence. And then it's able to detect that fluorescence through animal tissue like um, skull and skin and things like that. So this is, uh, the, the top row is mice before treatment, meaning they've had the glioma stem cells that express luciferase, which is a fluorescent protein. Uh, so this is be, but before the treatment. And we see that you know the there's fluorescence in all of their heads. This means that there's tumor cells that are growing in their in their brains. And then 47 days after injection of either the saline control or the dual nanoparticle formulation, we see that the control mice still have brain tumors, and the mice on the right that have been treated with the nanoparticles have a marked decrease in the size of the uh, brain tumors. And then when you look at uh, so this, this scale detects something called radiance. Radiance is just how bright the fluorescence is that's being detected by the uh, IVIS system. Uh, when you plot this, we see that there's a statistically significant difference in the radiance, which corresponds to the tumor volume. So the, the brighter the radiance, the larger the tumor volume. So the tumor volume is significantly bigger in the control mice compared to the, um, compared to the dual nanoparticle treated mice. Uh, and then you know, after we sacrificed the mice, so we, you know, shortly after this time point, we sacrificed the mice and, and sectioned the brains. And you see, I mean, this is just very striking here. So uh, the saline control mice, you have this giant brain tumor uh, that's, you know, causing midline shift. And in the nanoparticle uh, treated mice, you see a, a marked decrease in the size of the, of the brain tumor. So, um, you know, we're still working on this. We're still in the preliminary stage. We need to, um, it takes a long time to process these brains and stain them and image them. Uh, 
So we're, we're currently working our way through that, but I you know, just wanted to share these exciting preliminary results with you. Um, so with that, um, I would like to thank uh, you know, my mentor, Dr. Ivan, um, who's been just a, an amazing mentor and inspiration for me over these last uh, few years. Um, the members of his lab, Tatiana, um, Anna, Manuela, um, you know, Dr. Komatar for his mentorship as well. Um, the DAR lab for their help with uh, the nanoparticles, Bapu and Sritsa, and then uh, the Zyre lab for help with the um, mini brain project. Um, so with that, I just wanna say thank you and uh, see if you have any questions. Hey Dan, incredible work, uh, really amazing. Um, you know, um, I think this is an inspiration to me, hopefully an inspiration to your residents to say how much you can get accomplished in, in, in a year of research. And I hope you've submitted a bunch of this stuff for awards. It's, it's terrific. Congrats. Hey, thank you, Dr. Levy. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for your attention, everybody. So uh, let me just start an introduction. Um, Dr. Pablo D. Rivera Vacari is a research associate professor in the Department of Neurological Surgery. And over the last decade plus, uh, he and colleagues have been working on inflammasome signaling, which is part of the innate immune response to various types of uh, neurological and other um, human disorders. It's part of the innate immune response, as I said, in the the inflammasome response to stress occurs with bacteria, viruses, ischemia, poxia, and trauma. So we've been working for many years on clarifying how to measure inflammasome proteins in CSF and, and plasma samples as well as um, in experimental models. We've developed over the uh, last several years a new monoclonal antibody that targets abnormal inflammasome signaling. And that has led to strategies for therapeutic and now diagnostic approaches looking at inflammasome signaling as a, a very important um, outcome measure in our clinical studies and preclinical studies. So Pablo, along with um, Robert Keene, Department of Physiology, Helen Bramlett, Department of Neurological Surgery, myself, and working on that and working with colleagues throughout the university and the world on these types of uh, studies. So it's a very exciting area, and, and Pablo is one of the leaders in the world in, in, uh, in inflammasome signaling work. So hopefully he will be on in a few minutes and we can hear his lecture. Sorry for the delay. So today we'll talk a little bit about uh, what we've done on the inflammasome in the in the nervous system. Now we'll talk. At, it's gonna cover a little about uh, a bit about. Oops, let me share this screen. A bit about science, a bit about uh, business, and a little bit about drug development. So, so uh, as I was saying, we'll talk about a little bit about business uh, and in, in, in as well as. Uh, uh, drug development and a little bit about science. So uh, um, I'm fortunate enough that uh, I was able to be involved in the in the discovery of a monoclonal antibody that we're trying to uh, now take to uh, to the clinic. So I'm going to give you pretty much that journey that we went through um, uh, up to this point. So I have a couple of conflicts of interest. I'm a co-founder and um, uh, a managing member of Inflammacor, and I'm also a scientific advisory board member of uh, Zyversa Therapeutics. So this, uh, th this invention is about a monoclonal antibody that targets the innate immune response. And uh, the innate immune response is the early phase of the inflammatory response. Uh, here you can see it on the left side, it's characterized by the presence of pattern recognition receptors, such as toll-like receptors, not like receptors, which make inflammasomes, which is what I'm going to talk about uh, and, and in this presentation. And the uh, innate immune response go on to activate the adaptive immune response, which uh, uh, upon release of cytokines, the T cells and B cells are activated. B cells then go on to make antibodies. Now within the innate immune response, we have these pattern recognition receptors, uh, such as node-like receptors or uh, NLRs that make inflammasomes, as well as toll-like receptors in the cell membrane. And that they are activated by uh, pathogen-associated pathogen molecular patterns and danger associated molecular patterns. So pathogen, obviously, it's exogenous ligand. They, uh, that damps are 
endogenous ligands that go on to activate these pattern recognition receptors to mount an innate immune response. And uh, within the innate immune response, uh, our work focuses on the inflammasome. Inflammasome is a multiprotein complex comprised of uh, caspase 1, caspase 5 in humans, 11 and uh, 12 in rodents, as well as a, a sensor like a NALP1 or NLRP1, uh, um, a better known sensor is uh, NLRP3, and the adapter protein ASC, which uh, we actually uh, focus on for our therapeutic approaches. So the inflammasome, uh, it's this uh, cytoplasmic complex uh, shown here in this, uh, this wheel-like structure that goes on to activate caspase 1. Um, and upon activation of caspase 1, then uh, a couple of things happen. There is the activation of uh, 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 pro-inflammatory cytokines like pro-interleukin 1 beta and pro-interleukin 18 that then go on to, uh, to, to release the cytokines and spread the inflammatory response. Then we have uh, uh, um, the, uh, an inflammasome-mediated cell death process known as pyroptosis, which uh, occurs by the cleavage of gasermin D. Uh, once gasermin D gets cleaved, there's an amino terminus that gets incorporated to the cell membrane, and then the cell, lies, the cell starts to lyse, releases content, and then that's how cell death happens. Uh, through the inflammasome. The, uh, when uh, the inflammasome was first discovered in 2002, uh, cell complex involved uh, uh, or activated by bacterial infections. When we first uh, discovered the inflammasome uh, in, in the nervous system, we uh, published our work in 2008. When, uh, when we started working on the inflammasome back in 2005, there were only 12 particles on the inflammasome. Actually, eight, if, uh, if you, uh, it, did not include the, if you do not include the reviews. So uh, and most, of these, uh, most of these articles were on inflammasomes being activated uh, by bacteria, fungal infections, uh, and also in autoimmune uh, diseases. And then after that also came uh, viral infections. So when we started working on this, we didn't know, there were no reagents to study inflammasome proteins in, in, uh, in rodents, so, uh, but there were, there were uh, agents to look at inflammasome proteins in humans. So we used the, uh, the human spinal cord ba uh, um, bank in the, uh, in the, at the Miami project to use uh, these uh, human antibodies that were available to see if indeed, uh, uh, to test this hypothesis that uh, uh, Dr. Keane in physiology, who was my PhD mentor at the time, had come up with that the inflammasome was present in the spinal cord and played a role in the inflammatory response. So with Dr. Keane, we went on to do this staining uh, um, to look at uh, inflammasome protein expression in the human spinal cord, looking at LRP1, caspase 1, and ASC. And indeed, we, uh, we, we realized that uh, these inflammasome proteins were present in the, in the injured spinal cord. So it uh, was encouraging enough for us to then develop a, 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 a polyclonal, a rapid polyclonal antibody to target the, uh, to target the inflammasome or to study the inflammasome after a spinal cord injury in rats. So we, we, we had this, uh, this cervical injury model of a spinal cord injury, and then we had animals that, we, that were uh, not injured, which are the sham animals, and then animals that were injured and sacrificed at different time points after a spinal cord injury. And then, uh, uh, as you can see, Caspase 1, the, the executor of uh, uh, inflammasome activation, was elevated after, um, after a spinal cord injury compared to sham animals. And then we used uh, uh, an antibody against ASC that we had developed, and uh, we immunoprecipitated with that antibody uh, uh, we, against uh, uh, inflammasome proteins, ASC, NALP1, caspase 1, 11, XIAP, caspase 3 was used as a negative control. And uh, we, uh, indeed, we showed a protein association between these inflammasome proteins, signifying that indeed there is this inflammasome co complex forming in vivo. And then we looked at different cells in the CNS, and uh, the, the most exciting ones that we looked at was, uh, the, uh, was the presence of an inflammatory complex in neurons, because normally you don't think about the inflammasome uh, uh, cells in neurons. So uh, here, these are confocal images, so frozen sections that were double stained with a neuronal marker, shown in green. And then in red, you'll see the inflammasome proteins that are uh, uh, labeled here on the left side. And in, uh, you can see that after uh, six hours after spinal cord injury, there is an increase in the inflammasome protein expression in, in the uh, motor neurons of the, uh, the cervical spinal cord of, uh, of these rats. So having this, uh, so we had, you know, developed, we had an antibody that we used to, 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 um, to assay for ASC expression in the, in the rat spinal cord. So having a lot of this antibody, we decided, okay, so let's try this. Uh, let's see if we can actually use anti-ASC to treat uh, inflammation after spinal cord injury. So we deliver anti-ASC 50 micrograms intraperitoneal and intravenously for up to three days. And uh, uh, 
we, uh, we perform a series of analysis, including immunoblood analysis that you see here for inflammasome proteins for animals that were injured and untreated, animals that were treated, injured and treated with anti-ASC, and animals that were injured and treated with IgG. And as you can see in the anti-ASC treated animals, the expression levels of, of the inflammasome proteins, caspase 1, interleukin 1 beta, 18, XIP, were decreased uh, uh, by the anti-ASC treatment. When you compare anti-ASC with a parametric activity assay, uh, in the anti-ASC for caspase 1 activity, that, that group had lower levels than the, uh, of caspase activity than the no-antibody treated group, which was also consistent with improvement in histopathology. As you can see here in this HNE staining uh, with Luxpass Blue as well, where the uh, anti-ASC animals did better, which was quantified here in the lesion volume analysis, than the no-antibody treated group, which was also consistent with an improvement in, uh, in a variety a variety of uh, functional outcomes for, uh, uh, for limb function. So this was our first proof of concept that uh, we could use anti-ASC to target inflammasome and improve uh, outcomes. So then we, uh, with Dr. Dietrich, we went on to, to, to treat, uh, to do the same thing with, with, with an ALP1 antibody after a stroke and then with an anti-ASC uh, antibody after a traumatic brain injury. So then uh, having this, uh, this discovery, we decided to form a company to, uh, uh, to, develop, uh, the, the, to develop the drug to, to, to be able to treat uh, inflammasome, the inflammasome, particularly after CNS injury. So we, we formed Inflammacore with uh, Dr. Dietrich, Dr. Bramlett, and Dr. King. And the idea was to, um, with that company, be able to apply for a business grant to start a drug manufacturing uh, um, uh, um, process. So uh, uh, at the same time, uh, we, we continue obviously doing science and uh, we, uh, we started looking at the biomarker potential of inflammasome proteins. And here you see uh, the, the, the protein expression levels of, the, uh, of uh, patients that were, uh, you know, the GOS, the GOSC was, uh, the, yeah, the GOSC was the dichotomized into unfavorable and favorable outcomes. And then we measured inflammasome proteins acutely within the first uh, uh, three days after, after TBI. Sorry, after, yes, after, after TBI, and then uh, we, uh, oops. and then here we see that that those patients that had unfavorable outcomes had higher levels of inflammasome protein, uh, uh, inflammasome proteins acutely after uh, after injury when the GOS was assessed uh, five months after after trauma, indicating that you can use, look at inflammasome proteins acutely to predict long term outcomes in this patient population. So then, after that study, which we, you know we had already we had shown uh, for the first time in the CNS that these inflammasome proteins were secreted because they were present in the CSF, uh, other studies came to to show that indeed this ASC uh, protein and as well as NLRP3 inflammasome protein uh, they were released by the uh, by, by by cells and they were able to propagate the inflammatory response in a prion-like um, manner, and uh, uh, also as a uh, as a result that. Uh, leads to the spread of inflammation to other uh, other organs as well beyond the CNS. So uh, we filed a, a, a few patents after after forming Inflamacor in 2009, but uh, we, it wasn't it wasn't until uh, 2014 when we were able to actually apply for that STTR. Uh, and that, so there was this period of time where the infrastructure to 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 apply for STTR grants did not exist in the university. So, uh, but eventually, uh, with uh, with the help of uh, a, a, a grant writer here at the, at the university, Jennifer Daniels, we were able to to navigate the grant writing process as, as uh, 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 with that link between university and uh, industry. So that's when we got the first grant in 2014 for the STTR, where we started the the, the drug manufacturing process, and then. Uh, also around that time, we had already started the, the, the drug development process that I was that I'm about to describe to you with a grant from the Culture Foundation, which is an internal grant uh, uh, that the funds come from the from that this foundation. So the uh, so the first step we had a monoclonal antibody, but against mouse. So you can go through a, a different. Uh, uh, Stages of, uh, of of a monoclonal antibody. This is how a monoclonal antibody looks like. You see the with the heavy chain and the and and, and the light chains. But you can have a, a we had a, a mouse antibody that we had to make it look like a human antibody because you can have a chimeric antibody. Uh, an example of a chimeric antibody that uh, you may be familiar with is uh, a Remicade. Remicade is a monoclonal antibody that uh, 
had uh, that was one of the first ones, and it's still effective. But this half mouse, half human, and that's, that's and that explains why these uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies are more likely to to develop. Uh, or patients taking this this uh, these therapies are more uh, likely to develop anti drug antibodies due to to this chimeric uh, uh, nature. So then you have humanized antibodies. Humanized antibodies are more than ninety percent human, and uh, they, they are fairly well uh, accepted by the body without developing ADAs or anti drug antibodies. And then a human antibody. So we decided to. So the next the first step was to humanize and deimmunize the antibody. And. Uh, um, Based, and within the process of humanization, the immunization, there are uh, different things that you have to consider because there are, uh, there are IgG1, IgG2, 3, and 4 uh, immunoglobulins for, uh, that can be used as therapeutics. And, and you have to be careful because all of them have different half-lives. So for instance, making a monoclonal antibody uh, as an IgG3 antibody, it would be a bad choice because the half-life is seven days. So you want obviously a long, longer half-life, otherwise you'll have patient, the patient receiving um, infusions uh, uh, more often than not. So uh, we went with a, um, an IgG4 uh, uh, antibody. And uh, for that, we went to a company in, in Cambridge and the UK called Abzina, at the time it was called Antitope. And they, uh, they, uh, they were able to, to, to humanize the antibody with a technology that they have that by using, doing this humanization and immunization process, they're able to create fully, uh, fully, human, oops, fully human antibodies that are also devoid of T-cell epitopes, which results in a lower risk of developing anti-drug antibodies in patients. So, um, so IC100, which is the, the, the commercial uh, label, or not the commercial, but the, the, the development name that we used uh, for, for anti-ASC, uh, IC as in Inflamacor. So it was Inflamacor 100, so uh, it's an IgG4 antibody that has very weak uh, uh, anti-drug antibody activity, and it's the and it's uh, uh, when when you have to choose what type of antibody you want to develop, as I had mentioned, in addition to the half-life, you want to consider what is what is the function that you want that antibody to. Do. So we wanted to block the inflammasome. So for for blocking of the inflammasome, the IgG4 is the most uh, uh, useful approach. The uh, uh, if you want to to have uh, you sell mediated cytotoxicity effects uh, in 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 your therapeutic, then you go for an IgG one. So depending on what you want to do, you you decide the type of immunoglobulin. Uh, we went for IgG four because we wanted to block inflammasome uh, assembly. So uh, and then another characteristic of IgG four is that it's stabilized with a, a, a mutation that prevents chain switching, and which also makes it uh, less likely to for patients to develop uh, anti drug antibodies. So he, um, there's an, uh, an assay that we did to check for this uh, uh, likelihood of developing ADAs uh, in vitro, and uh, it's this, this technology called EpiScreen that uh, Abzina has. And basically, uh, it looks at the T cell epitopes, which drive, uh, which activate uh, CD4 T cells, that uh, uh, help uh, helps B cells to develop anti-drug antibodies. So uh, um, we, we analyzed uh, with, with this uh, uh, with this assay how likely it is for an antibody for our antibody to develop these anti-drug antibodies in their assay. So with those cells that have an stimulation index above 1.90 stimulated. Uh, uh, are, are said to, to be immunogen, immunogenic. So, so what does that mean? So we assess the, the immunogenicity by looking at uh, this epigenetic screening, where T lymphocytes were obtained from 50 healthy volunteers, and then they were treated with IC100. So then uh, we measure the, uh, the, uh, the, the levels of interleukin-2, and by we actually the company, uh, uh, Abzina, and then incorporated thymidine as a radioactive thymidine. So, uh, uh, and then they had this, they measured the stimulation index. And those patients that had higher levels of uh, uh, above this threshold were said to be uh, immuno immunogenic. So it turns out that when we looked at IC100, 9% of, of the patients in, in that group had uh, uh, were uh, uh, shown some immuno immunogenicity. So then uh, it turns, so as a result, the, uh, we, we uh, concluded that. And uh, IC100 was safe. Uh, it was a, a safe drug in terms of uh, at least uh, based on dating culture. That uh, in vitro, and that it's this this antibody when given to a uh, to, to a person is less likely to cause uh, uh, anti-drug antibodies, because those um, those uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies that are below 10% in this uh, in the in that threshold 
or 10% uh, immunogenicity, uh, are less likely to develop ADAs compared to those patients, those that are above, uh, above that uh, 10 threshold. And uh, however, there are monoclonal antibodies in the market that are above that, uh, that threshold and they're still successful. But uh, eventually when patients start developing ADAs, then you have to switch them to a different, uh, uh, to a different monoclonal antibody. So we expect le uh, less of that happening with IC100 therapy. So once you have the, the humanized, uh, you have, we, you know, we had a, a safe, humanized, demonized monoclonal antibody. So then we developed, uh, uh, we had to develop a manufacturing cell line to uh, produce the antibody. So for that, we used uh, uh, a company in Sweden, uh, sorry, in Switzerland called uh, Selexis. And um, Selexis with their, with, their, um, with their technology, they're able to, pr to uh, produce these uh, very stable cell lines. And with these cell lines, uh, I, you just don't want to look at uh, stability, but also the the uh, uh, the reputation of the company. So obviously, the idea is to move forward is to move forward to the clinic, which requires licensing and investment uh, 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 from um, uh, bigger from big pharma. So you want to go with companies that actually want that actually big pharma trusts. And also, not just that, but uh, you know, when we did the humanization of the antibody, we also uh, uh, it was a fee for service. But with with the cell line development, there is actually also royalties associated with it. So at this at this point, you, you got to be careful because you you can you don't want to give uh, that many royalties from the beginning of the, your manufacturing process because then uh, uh, you're so then there is so much that that you have given away from the beginning that then other uh, other companies will not want to license your technology because uh, uh, they'll see their own efforts also diluted so you just don't want to go with somebody that actually can produce the company uh, 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 that can produce a reliable uh, manufacturing cell line but you also want uh, to to have the right uh, the right licensing agreement so that uh, you, you will not become uh, 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 you will not hinder yourself from, from licensing your technology in the future. So we were able to produce this, this uh, manufacturing cell line with Selexis that was very stable and, and produced antibody at a high concentration for that particular stage. Because if you have a manufacturing cell line that doesn't produce that much antibody, then that means that the, your downstream uh, drug development process might be also hindered. And, and uh, at the end of the process, you know, you may not be end, end up developing, a, a, you know, you may not end up giving an infusion for, you know, 30 minutes, three days or, uh, but, you know, there's a biologic that is, uh, is given for, um, for two days for, for uh, postpartum depression. You know, the, the mother remains in, in, in bed for uh, two days and the, the biologic is infused for those two days. So you don't want to also, that, that scenario where you produce that little, with your, that your manufacturing cell line produces that little antibody to, 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 um, uh, be able to produce a, a, a drug with high enough concentration. So then we developed, uh, we, we tested the immunoreactivity. What targets the, the, uh, in the body the, uh, the IC100 IC binding to? So there's this FDA organ uh, tissue array and uh, which comprised of 99 cores, 33 uh, sites from 75 patients. Uh, and then uh, we, uh, um, we looked at uh, uh, the nervous system, the digestive system, the reproductive system, all the systems that uh, to see which which tissues in these different systems IC100 was recognized. So with this, uh, you can use this data not just for indication selection uh, in or, or indication expansion, but also for the design of your toxicology studies. Since so these are targets that were the that could act as sinks for the for the antibody. So IC100 is uh, an IgG4 antibody with a. Uh, um, a binding, uh, a binding kinetics in the in the sub nanomolar range, which is ideal for a therapeutic monoclonal, and it has a strong dissociation rate. Uh, uh, sorry, it has a, a, a fast uh, association rate and or a fast binding with a slow dissociation uh, rate, and it cross, re cross reacts with human, mouse, rat, and swine. Under its role, uh, it's only inhibiting the inflammasome with a half life of 15 to 30 days, uh, based on preliminary uh, studies uh, in mice. So then we faced uh, um, that process that everybody pretty much faces in the drug development uh, process, which is the value of death, which is, uh, you know, for, for us was, okay, we need this much money to take, make it to the next step, right? So it's that bridge between, the, it's that non-existent bridge between uh, um, academia and, uh, and industry. For some people, the, we were lucky enough that the value of death for us was not uh, uh, a lack of knowledge on what we needed to do before because we had actually very good people advising us. Uh, 
<laughs> but it was okay. We need to, we need now a lot of money to start manufacturing the, the to start manufacturing the drug uh, um, and move move this forward to the clinic. So uh, at the same time, we were actually uh, um, interested in 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 multiple sclerosis. We started collaborating with uh, uh, Dr. Roberta Brambilla here at uh, uh, at the Miami Project, and. Uh, uh, MS was a uh, was a nice uh, a nice uh, indication to go for because uh, as 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 you are uh, as you are aware it is very hard to license a technology for uh, an acute CNS indication. Uh, so we wanted a, a chronic CNS indication and uh, multiple sclerosis just made sense. It had a, a, a good market for 400,000 patients. So, and inflammasome was clearly involved in multiple sclerosis. Uh, there are inflammasome proteins in, in, uh, this, that have been described in, in MS patients, uh, as well as the animal model of, uh, um, of multiple sclerosis, the AAE model. The, 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 one of the current therapies for, for uh, MS, interferon beta, has also been shown to inhibit inflammasome. And uh, also, there in, and the downstream cytokines associated with inflammasome activation are uh, are also elevated in in such as interleukin eighteen are also elevated in these multiple sclerosis patients. And there is also evidence that uh, ASC plays a role in the uh, in the pathology of uh, of multiple sclerosis in the animal model. So here you have caspase one knockout animals compared to wild types, also in LRP three, and this is a clinical score. So as you can see, there is a better clinical score for the uh, ASC uh, uh, knockout animals compared to wild types, and also compared to the NLRP3 and Caspase 1 uh, knockouts, indicating that ASC is actually a good target for multiple sclerosis, at least in the animal model. So with uh, Dr. Brambilla, we, uh, in her lab, uh, she tested IC, uh, IC100 at different concentrations for the clinical score, and uh, it turned out that at 30 mix per kg, there was also an improvement of, uh, uh, in clinical score by using this, uh, this approach. Which uh, was also uh, consistent with increase in uh, in CD4 uh, cells and CD8 cells uh, infiltration in the spinal cord, and also uh, activation of microglia in the, in the spinal cord, indicating that yes, we can affect the the immune response with IC100, which uh, 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 partially explained the the, the, benef the beneficial effects seen in the clinical score. So as we had this chronic indication. There was also a, a tension that was being gathered uh, uh, on the financial side. So uh, a, a company had been formed uh, in, in August 2017 called IFM Therapeutics as a, uh, they, that, that, used, that was targeting uh, and is still targeting the NLRP3 inflammasome. Then uh, uh, Roche and Unitech, they, uh, they bought uh, another company for undisclosed terms that uh, was also focusing on the inflammasome. And then Novartis acquired uh, uh, a subsidiary of IFM Therapeutics for $130 million up front and 1.3 billion in milestones for their drug, uh, for their program targeting uh, NLRP3 inflammasome. As this was happened, uh, uh, also Jecure uh, Therapeutics, they raised $20 million in a Series A, Notera, $40 million. Uh, the Inflasome also raised $46 million in, ser in Series B. So finally, uh, there was a, a, an interest from, uh, uh, from Big Pharma and Wall Street into, into this inflammasome field, something that when we had started, to, I remember there were only uh, eight, eight, eight articles on inflammasome, but now the attention on inflammasome was so much that uh, um, companies were, uh, were seeing the potential of inflammasome and they were investing millions of dollars. So what had we done at that point? We had a monoclonal antibody. We had proof of concept in an, an acute indication, a chronic indication. We had uh, accumulated uh, uh, important intellectual property and uh, we had uh, humanized and immunized the antibody. So we had a human antibody and we had a manufacturing cell line to produce the human antibody. We had tested the cross-reactivity in humans, non-human primates, mouse, mice, and swine. We knew the, the tissue immune reactivity of IC100, its half-life, and the binding affinity, and everything looked um, promising. So uh, uh, to this day, we have 12 US patents filed, 59 are international, and, and 15 of those national and international patents have been granted. So we had a good... Uh, um, uh, we have a good uh, uh, patent uh, um, patent protection program, but in addition to that, uh, at that point we had to reestablish ourselves with, as one of the leading institutions on the inflammasome field in, in in the world. So we we had a, a good product and we had a, a good reputation, and as, as uh, something that is important in in biotech is that. Uh, investors not just invest in a particular product, they, they invest in a team. 
So uh, uh, that was very important. You know, when I was, before I, I, I got more deeper into translational medicine, uh, um, my thought was, oh, you know, it's, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't want to focus too much into publishing uh, articles. I want to do the whole more translational, uh, more translational thing. But articles come with, uh, with, uh, with important information and, 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 uh, and, uh, and a reputation of your own work. So that's important and also for investors. So that's, we we're fortunate enough that we had uh, invested uh, significant uh, resources in, in inflammation programs. So we were able to stand uh, in, in uh, uh, and be competitive in the world of the inflammation in the nervous system. So uh, uh, at this point, you know, just to, su to summarize where, where, where we're at, uh, up, to, up to, to that particular stage where we had the licensing, we had, uh, we had uh, uh, you know, our ad advisor, that told us uh, that instructed us how to to start developing the the manufacturing cell line. By then, there were already five thousand uh, over five thousand articles on inflammasome, and then we had the work with uh, uh, with Dr. Brambilla on the EA, on her EAE model testing IC one hundred. So with that and the interests of uh, industry, we were able to license the, the all the patents to Zyversa Therapeutics. Uh, with uh, with that, uh, uh, you know, the, then the, the the game changed. You know, we were able to do things like this. Are intracellular multi-protein complexes comprised of three components. First is a unique sensor molecule like NLRP3. There are at least six different sensor molecules, each stimulated by different pathogens or internal stressors. Inflammasomes are named after the associated sensor molecule. This is an NLRP3 inflammasome. Second is adapter protein ASC, associated with all six types of inflammasomes. Third is enzyme procaspase 1. How are inflammasomes formed and activated to trigger inflammation? In the presence of relevant pathogens or other inducers, the sensor molecule is stimulated, triggering a conformational change and oligomerization to form a wheel-shaped signaling hub. This hub recruits ASC, which also begins to oligomerize, and recruit procaspase-1. The inflammasome continues to recruit ASC and procaspase-1, forming a large filamentous signaling platform known as an ASC spec. This provides a scaffold for recruitment of more procaspase-1 molecules and triggers conversion of procaspase-1 to its active form, caspase-1 which is released from the spec. Caspase-1 cleaves cytokine pro-IL-1 beta to its active form, IL-1 beta, a powerful stimulator of inflammation. Inflammasomes not only initiate intracellular inflammation, they also promote extracellular inflammation by releasing ASC specs outside the cell. This perpetuates an ongoing damaging inflammatory response, contributing to a variety of inflammatory diseases. Targeting inflammasomes to control inflammation before it becomes pathogenic is a promising therapeutic approach for millions with inflammatory disorders. IC100, a monoclonal antibody, is a promising approach to treating inflammatory disorders. IC100 uniquely binds to ASC proteins and inhibits ASC recruitment by activated NLRP3, thereby preventing initiation of inflammation. IC100 also binds to ASC in intracellular and extracellular ASC specs, preventing further recruitment of ASC and procaspase-1. In doing so, IC100 interferes with ASC spec function, blocking perpetuation of chronic damaging inflammation. Because ASC proteins are associated with at least six types of inflammasomes, IC100 has potential to treat numerous inflammatory disorders associated with activation of one or more types of inflammasome. In summary, IC100 is a novel ASC inhibitor that blocks inflammasome formation, preventing initiation of inflammation. It also interferes with ASC spec function, blocking perpetuation of inflammation. This controls chronic inflammation that contributes to disease. So that's the mechanism of action of IC100, and uh, uh, you know when when they told when they told me the uh, 
how much was to make that video. I thought that uh, they had hired uh, Morgan Freeman to uh, to do the narration of that video. But uh, basically, that shows uh, uh, that shows the investors the, the mechanism of action of uh, of IC100. So, what are the next steps uh, with uh, uh, that we were that for which we needed that money to uh, to get out of the valley of death? So, we need to do uh, what we need to do is uh, ADME studies, uh, social distribution, metabolism, and excretion studies, uh, which include the biodistribution, a single and multiple dose uh, PK and half life in mice and humans. We have to do uh, indication expansion as part of primary pharmacology. In in vitro studies, we have to do functional potency assays in mouse, rats, non human primates, humans. Uh, keep on uh, also doing the mechanism of action uh, research studies in, in, in vitro to understand how the antibody uh, works. We have to develop assays to test uh, if IC100 actually has an activity as we start developing the drug. Uh, so we need to develop that, uh, that assay. Uh, it's an uh, right now we're working on an electrochemiluminescent uh, immuno assay that uh, uh, re reacts in rodents and human that can be done for rodents, non human primates, and humans. And after you develop it, it has to be further, they actually have to be validated. And then I, uh, you need the, the, we need the preliminary toxicology, uh, non GLP, which is a repeat dose uh, uh, 21 day range finding uh, uh, TK ADA study, as well as a GLP uh, toxicology study in non human primates, which includes uh, toxicokinetics for four weeks and uh, non human primate in non human primates at three uh, uh, months and six months. So that was so. Th that's the, the next step in this uh, IND for this IND enabling data for the uh, IND package. So for that, obviously, it takes uh, takes a village. So uh, in the case of Diversa, uh, it means they there is a CEO, uh, a chief scientific officer, a financial officer, commercial officer, medical officer. There's the vice president of corporate development. There's legal counsel, board of directors, as well as the scientific advisory board, to which uh, we are uh, a part of. So uh, um, um, the, the lead indication uh, to, uh, even to this date, it remains multiple sclerosis. And uh, um, when, now when you start actually thinking about you know, lead indication in, in industry, you start looking at, okay, obviously the role of the, 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 the target or the inflammation they are targeting in uh, the indication that you're targeting with the disease, with the antibody, sorry. And uh, uh, for our case was multiple sclerosis. There was an, it's important to look at the unmet medical need uh, obviously, that gives you the, your, your your appreciation for the market share, but you also need to to have a, an acceptable animal model that investors uh, uh, and not just scientists will be uh, uh, comfortable with to test a drug that eventually could be translated to humans. Even though everybody accepts that or recognizes that there is no good animal model of uh, of most diseases. Uh, so, uh, and then obviously something important for uh, for your lead indication is that you have to have established clinical endpoints for your clinical trials so that you know exactly how to read whether a, a drug is beneficial or not. And that could also, and for multiple sclerosis that has, that, uh, has been already shown, obviously. And uh, uh, the, the market size, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, obviously very important uh, from the commercial rationale. And the competitive la landscape, it's, it's uh, um, big pharma will, will it, be more likely to invest on something that somebody else has already shown that can be treated, that, uh, like multiple sclerosis, than something that has that is less that hasn't really been shown to 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 have that many promising uh, um, promising therapies, if any. So the, the competitive landscape is, is important in that sense, uh, and also obviously there has to be a need for your drug for your uh, drug. Your drug has to displace uh, uh, another drug in the market, and also it has to even displace. Uh, a, a drug in development in their own uh, in their own platform. So let's say a big pharma a, a big pharmaceutical company buys your buys licenses your patent, but uh, uh, all your patents. But then all of a sudden uh, they find that your patent is not that uh, or your invention is not that uh, um, exciting or promising. Then they still have they still hold the patent, but the patents, but they may not develop it further. You know you have to your your project has to be so so. Uh, 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 um, Attractive to them that they will decide to put aside whatever they were developing before to, to fit it in into their uh, uh, pipeline, uh, what you uh, want to license to them, and obviously you have uh, uh, payer perceptions are very important uh, when you look at uh, at indication selection, since obviously if, you know you can have a great invention, but if uh, uh, that is already commercial uh, that is already uh, uh, approved by the FDA, but if you cannot commercialize it, then it's uh, you, it's still not going to work. 
for patients. So uh, one of the assays that we did was a whole blood assay uh, that uh, uh, Dr. King worked on. Uh, it's a functional potency assay look, uh, using this device from a um, uh, mesoscale, which uses electrochemical luminescence, where the whole blood, which is very attractive because it has all these uh, immune cells and gives you a good appreciation for for uh, what would happen in a human uh, while still doing it in, in vitro. Uh, we stimulated with uh, an, uh, a typical inflammasome activation protocol, which is LPS and ATP, and then inhi inhibited with IC100 uh, uh, at different concentrations. And then here you can see the dose response uh, in, by inhibiting the outcome of uh, IL-1 beta in, in humans, indicating that IC100 targets uh, uh, inflammasome activation. Here was assessed by IL-1 beta release into the blood. Another assay that we did was a biodistribution study. So uh, uh, IC100 and IgG, so group two is IgG, group three is IC100, and as you, uh, uh, then the, these proteins, this, uh, these antibodies were um, labeled with a fluorochrome. And here's the imaging of the fluorochrome. The group, group one uh, had uh, no labeled uh, antibody. This is just a control group. And as you can see, IgG and IC100 uh, biodistribution was all throughout the body. And here you can see the quantification of that uh, in, uh, in, non in the brain and the spinal cord at eight and 48 hours, and indicating that IC100 was able to penetrate the CNS. Then uh, uh, um, we looked at uh, uh, tissue, uh, tissue distribution also in other tissues, and we found that uh, IC100 was also present uh, in, in all those other tissues, particularly uh, the liver uh, and, the, uh, and the lungs, among others. So uh, IC100 by distribution uh, remains at least up to 96 uh, hours, uh, as you can see from this imaging, imaging uh, uh, in the left side in the ventral distribution. And it's uh, similar to, uh, to IgG4 uh, as well. Now, in, we also did target engagement. And uh, this is an uh, uh, experiment that uh, uh, Dr. Gina has been working on. And this is IC100 taken up by, um, by macrophages and at different time points. IC100 was labeled with a fluorescent molecule. And as you can see, IC100 is able to penetrate these cells, uh, consistent with the idea that IC100 also uh, penetrates uh, tissues, uh, uh, tissues, not just uh, uh, that it acts extracellularly. And it was also able to bind to, uh, um, by flow cytometry, was, uh, we were able to acid that it was able to, to bind to CD4, CD8, monocytes, natural kills, killer cells, and B cells. In an ex vivo assay, we had uh, uh, ASC filaments uh, assembled, as you can see here from the pyrene domain of ASC. Uh, ASC has two domains, pyrene domain and a card domain. So this is a pyrene domain of ASC, and uh, uh, you can see, you see these filaments here that are formed at 30 minutes in this uh, uh, cell-free system. And IC100 decreases the formation of those filaments, uh, as you can see from uh, in this figure right here. And this is just this, the, uh, the, um, the uh, electron microscopy, frozen electron microscopy, image, the cryo EM image of, uh, of IC100 bound, bound to these filaments um, in high magnification, indicating uh, target engagement. Uh, an in vivo target uh, engagement study was looking at IC100, uh, which here is as, uh, uh, shown as, as MAB, in an age in a model of aging in the brain. So this is a brain of uh, animals that were young animals, three months and 18 month old animals that were treated with saline and treated with IC100. And as you can see, inflammation activation was decreased in the NLRP1 Casper one ac group. And also uh, lower the formation of these ASC specs, uh, which are these pathogenic oligomers of ASC uh, that the video was uh, describing. So that's also an example of target engagement in vivo. So uh, uh, in addition to that, we have, uh, uh, we have shown in, 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 in mice and uh, non-human primates that three, uh, that uh, IC100 is safe, uh, at least in a single dose, at concentrations as high as 300 mg per kg, which is, uh, uh, is, pr is probably 100 times more than what we, uh, we will uh, give it to a human. You have to be mindful uh, of uh, the, the, the final concentration when you start doing your drug development process that uh, um, uh, you're, and also use selective indication that you, don't, you want a drug that you don't need to, that much of it obviously to have an effect and that you can deliver that drug as, uh, without causing uh, problems like coagulation and things like that, uh, uh, because obviously that would become detrimental. So, uh, but at least at 300 mix per kg in mice and non-human primates, uh, IC100 was shown, uh, uh, those animals did not show any uh, overt uh, toxicity effects. 
So that's uh, that's the uh, the the, the IND enabling part. Now, when we look at, uh, at the CMC, we need to actually, you know, we still need to make the drug, right? So that's the, the, the CMC part of the drug development process, which is the chemistry, manufacturing, and controls, and that includes uh, uh, analytic analytical methods for the drug process development, intravenous formulation in development, the reference material characterization, the master cell bank development, analytical methods qualification, non-GMP drug substance stability, and then GMP uh, bulk drug substance stability, which you will use for your uh, to present for your PND meeting and your IND filing, and, and you will also use that for a phase one uh, for all those for all these processes you can actually rely on different different batches of uh, of the uh, of the drug so you can use research grade material or supply and confirmation raw material for these processes uh, for these processes here in the second group you can use uh, uh, the results from the demo for the, from the first demo run and then for the non-gmp you can use uh, uh, you can use material from the second demo uh, demo run so for that, uh, we, uh, uh, you know, at that point, we, we contacted KBI uh, uh, Bio, uh, Biopharma in uh, North Carolina to start doing the, uh, the, the, the drug manufacturing or the CMC part. At that point now already, there were, there were 13 art 13,000 articles on the inflammation. We, we started, there were only 12, uh, including reviews. So now we're uh, years, 18 years later, now there's 13,000 13, articles on, above, uh, on the inflammasome. So obviously everybody was very excited about the inflammasome. So we went to North Carolina to look at the facilities. And uh, for instance, this facility here where they store the, uh, the, the, the cell bank. So, uh, um, because obviously uh, you, you, you always want to have a reference material as you start splitting the cells, you know, so start mutating. So you want to make sure you also have a reference material. They have another facility in a, in a different state to, to make sure that that's uh, safeguarded. And the same thing with the cell, uh, with the manufacturing cell line in Switzerland, actually. So this, these are the, uh, and the idea is to take, uh, uh, you know, that monoclonal that one day came, uh, when they actually came in this bottle, uh, the, well, uh, this is the first bottle where that rabid, anti, uh, rabid monoclonal antibody, uh, rabid polyclonal antibody came in. But now taking this little bottle now uh, eventually became a mouse monoclonal antibody and the idea is to take it to a, to a, a, a big bioreactor. So this is, it's just doing culture, but in a big, uh, in a big process, in a, in, a, in a big scale. So this involves uh, in an ideal world, which obviously the, the world is not ideal. It takes 58.2 uh, weeks. Um, which involves these processes that I just described to you. And this process is happening in parallel. And this is a good graph because actually everything that I mentioned so far should happen in parallel as much as possible because you, you don't want to finish one thing to start the next one because then obviously will, the drug development process will become much longer. Uh, right now we're here in, uh, uh, um, in the bulk drug substance production with, uh, with KBI Biopharma. And uh, uh, with that, we'll be able to start uh, doing the, the, the last uh, studies uh, looking at, um, at the uh, cytotoxicity, the, the, the toxicokinetic studies, and, and uh, confirming the, uh, the half-life studies with the GMP, with the non-GMP material. So what, what if, uh, I've shown you today, it's that uh, uh, a, a bit of the process that uh, we've gone through to develop a monoclonal antibody. I'm sure you you, you all uh, are are more familiar, way more familiar than I am in in the, the the development of the clinical trial. But this is how a bit of about how uh, a drug gets uh, gets made all the way from discovery uh, to 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 production, at least uh, up to the stage of production that I've been able to to experience myself. So IC100 has a, a, a half life of approximately 24 days with a low immunogenicity of 9%, indicating that, there's, that uh, uh, we probably dose, dose the antibody about every two months uh, and, uh, for a chronic indication. And, it and it, it, due to the low immunogenicity, there will be a, a, less li a lower likelihood of patients developing uh, AVAs. So it has a strong binding affinity in humans and non-human primates, as well as uh, rodents. Uh, in the uh, in the subnanomolar range, that's what you want. Uh, subnanomolar range binding affinity for uh, therapeutic uh, MAB, uh, with a fast association rate and a slow dissociation rate as well. It's, and that's how it's actually interacting. This is the the uh, uh, pharmacodynamics of how the antibody is interacting with the uh, with the body. So, and then uh, 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 in vivo bioluminescence shows that IC100 has a broad tissue distribution that cross reacts with uh, uh, that crosses the broadband barrier and penetrates the, the brain and the spinal cord, among other tissues, actually. In naive mice, uh, uh, we've also shown that in that same biodistribution study that 
IC-100 penetrates the liver, lung, kidney, heart, ovaries, thyroid tissues as the major sites. And then confocal microscopy images show that IC-100 gets inside the cells and that also uh, in the CNS and also a variety of immune cells. And in uh, our cell-free inflammasome assays and our whole blood human assays, uh, uh, we've shown that IC-100 binds to ASC to inhibit IL-1 beta as part of the potency assays. So, uh, um, uh, and finally, IC-100 has uh, shown no signs of, uh, of toxicity in rodents and non-humans as part of non-human primates at the concentrations of as high as 300 mg per kg. The, uh, so this, these are my, uh, uh, my uh, current uh, collaborating uh, laboratories. I want to particularly highlight uh, Dr. King, uh, who first came up with this, this idea of inflammasome uh, in, in a sterile event. Back then, nobody had thought that inflammasome could be actually activated in a sterile event. And then also Dr. Dietrich and Dr. Bramlett, uh, which, which, you know, we, we, together we, uh, we formed this company to, to make this, uh, this uh, happen. The, uh, but uh, this is just a uh, small part of the team of, of uh, a much bigger team, and you might recognize. Uh, you know, I've been I've been here uh, um, doing research the many projects since two thousand five. So you may recognize a lot of these names, and uh, uh, obviously, not, not, no, no, all, all this takes uh, takes a big team to 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 be able to to achieve these things. So uh, I want to also recognize this. Uh, uh, these individuals because it's uh, you know this story wouldn't be as good uh, as, as it is these days uh, uh, if it wasn't for for them i gave a similar talk back in 2014 and uh, you know there's a 30 million dollar difference to this 2022 version and uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh it's uh, it's been a great uh, journey so i want to thank you all for paying attention uh this morning I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you very, yeah. thank you very much, Pablo. Van, fantastic presentation. Uh, great example of drug discovery at the University of Miami. I mean, obviously, uh, the the uh, university is very uh, supportive of drug discovery, and this is a great example of moving an idea, hopefully, all the way to the clinic. So, thank you very much. Uh, questions, please. Um, this is a question. Um, is there what's the mechanism by which um, these these an antibodies get into the nervous system? Is there an uptake mechanism, or do they just diffuse, or what? Yes. Uh, uh, so the, the, the short answer is we we we're not one hundred percent sure. But the studies nowadays uh, that Dr. Keen is carrying out, this is one of the favorite things that uh, Dr. Keen likes to work on. Uh, uh, and I'm thankful for that because that's uh, you know that doesn't wake me up every morning uh, to find out. Uh, you know this, this this very 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 important question, which is uh, uh, apparently FC mediated receptor uh, internalization of uh, uh, of the antibody is is likely is likely and anti the antibody uh, also um, has evidence of being internalized uh, uh, in, in uh, endosomes. So uh, there is a natural mechanism of uh, the, through the Bramble receptor through which uh, immunoglobulins get internalized. So uh, it seems that uh, that might be part of how the antibody is uh, working. However, the, the, the studies uh, ex, ex, uh, uh, on, the, on our, biomarker, our biomarker studies suggest that uh, uh, the, the extracellular role of, of, of the inflammasome is actually quite uh, relevant as well. So uh, for instance, you know, we, can re we can equate injury severity or disease severity to extracellular levels of uh, inflammasome proteins in the, in the CNS. Uh, Sorry, in the blood and and, and 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 the CSF, so it is likely that also the antibody is actually working uh, important has an important role by blocking the inflammasome proteins extracellularly. Thank you. You're welcome, Dr. Barrett. John Gillespie. Hi, uh, so Pablo, I I want to be the first who doesn't have a conflict of interest to say that I thought this was a really exciting talk. <laughs> Oh, thank you. I appreciate and it. And a great example of drug discovery. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, you made my day. You made my day. <laughs> and so my question is kind of related to Ellen's, uh, which has to do with the drug itself. Um, to what extent do you know that the entire antibody is required or responsible for its uh, putative therapeutic effect? Or would it be possible to make a smaller drug that had the uh, therapeutic effect without some of the potential side effects. Yes, it, it definitely just uh, just relying on on a smaller antibody like the, 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 the actual binding region uh, that actually will neutralize the the antibody would uh, 
would probably work better. It uh, at, at the, the decision at, at that point in, from the manufacturing perspective was that uh, we had to go with something that uh, that is more widely acceptable acceptable by by uh, big pharma. They feel more comfortable with. So the uh, we went with a, with a traditional approach instead of being like bolder and more innovative because uh, you know that's the, that's the that's the that's the the, the 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 issue with being a smaller fish, you know, so those those more innovative things can definitely be tried uh, with more uh, more confidence in, in big pharma because they can try anything, you know, they show you that it works. But for us, you know, we had to go with a more traditional approach. Another approach, for instance, that it brings me up to the issue of um, monoclonal antibody. Human, we could use a mouse, uh, a mouse uh, that produces human human already fully human antibodies, right, or humanized antibodies. But then you you run the risk of uh, 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 associated with that production, you have to pay royalties to, to, to the people that produce the mouse. And so that further dilutes you, which then makes you uh, um, uh, more uh, less likely for, you know, less attractive to, to big pharma for licensing. So it was a, a combination of things of what can we do and what can we do successfully? Because also, you know, it's uh, 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 by specific antibodies nowadays are a big thing. Um, back, back when we were looking at this thing, also by specific antibodies were not were not that uh, uh, exciting. So it uh, we had to go with you know the more traditional approach. But yes, I think uh, your approach is, is is your suggestion is correct. I think it would probably work better because higher penetration and probably also affinity and all that. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Uh, great, great talk. I just want to know what your thoughts were on on IC100 replacing steroids. Do you think that they're working similar in like a similar aspect, or do you think it's completely different kind of uh, pathways? For, for, fortunately, yeah, it's a more specific approach. Uh, um, the 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 benefit of targeting the the, uh, the inflammasome is that it's very early in the inflammatory response. It targets the inhibitory response. So if you go if you target upstream in the drug in the um, um, Molecular pathways of, uh, of of disease, then all the cross talking that happens below those the activation of those molecular pathways are less likely to occur. So uh, uh, the the specificity in general of monoclonal of monoclonal antibodies or therapies and uh, the er the early intervention at the molecular level uh, probably offers uh, uh, not just uh, uh, a greater benefit but also the likelihood of less side effects. Uh, it uh, you know the, the, the steroids work mostly. You know, it's like a big explosion if you if you want to kill everything in there. You know, so this one is a more specific uh, approach, and the early uh, uh, intervention allows for for inhibiting um, more pathways downstream. So probably, yeah, it, we our hope is that there will be less side effects as well as uh, a more and also you know a longer uh, a longer half life, right? So less treatment and uh, just like with uh, anti TNF uh, drugs, for instance, we would see something similar. Ellen? Another question. Um, when you were talking about multiple sclerosis, were you talking just about just about the, uh, the relapsing remitting kind or the progressive kind that's so much worse? Right. So, so um, definitely for the for the uh, um, the design of the so when we gave the when we gave the, the drug in the AE uh, model, it was uh, uh, after the Right, right after induction, but before the clinical symptoms started. Now, in terms of the, uh, clinical trial design, to, there will um, probably be an arm to, to target uh, to target both, so that uh, uh, an arm of the study will have uh, uh, those. You know, because obviously, you know, you want to treat as a low, lower hanging fruit. So, which one is easier to treat, so you can actually have a a, a path forward? But then, obviously, you also want to to, to meet that market that hasn't been addressed. So definitely, we'll also address the, uh, uh, the, the, the most advanced uh, uh, or high, high, harder to treat uh, um, indication because obviously there is a, uh, an unmet need there. Fortunately, we have this approach of uh, using biomarkers where we can actually look at uh, ASC and other inflammatory uh, markers in the, in the serum of, uh, of patients. So we can actually tire the drug accordingly and also use that as, as uh, inclusion for, for, for patients. So, uh, 
having said that, obviously you don't want to limit the, 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 the size of the recruitment of your subjects because obviously you need enough power for, for the trial. So you so there, overall there would be multiple sclerosis patients. Then there will be multiple sclerosis patients where AC levels are high. And then you have an arm where, where uh, uh, you have the different types of uh, multiple sclerosis uh, as well as, as you just uh, brought up. Thank you. Your order. Um, Pablo, why isn't uh, spinal cord injury your first uh, primary indication for IC100? Oh, it, it is mine. It's, it's the issue is the issue is uh, 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 convincing the companies to that it will be it will be uh, it will be there first. So the way I see it is, uh, uh, um, we have to we get we need to get uh, IC100 manufactured, and then it's going to be tested in a in a in a in a in a clinical trial for an indication. Let's say multiple sclerosis. Let's say a renal disease, which is. Uh, uh, something that uh, you know, Zyversa uh, and and, uh, and whoever and, and up uh, uh, licensing that technology will decide. However, once IC100 is manufactured, there is uh, there is no reason why we cannot here at the university uh, with you all we can test uh, IC100 after a spinal cord injury and after brain injury, male infertility after a spinal cord injury. So there's a variety of things. So uh, yes, I'm definitely enthusiastic about that. Also, neuroprotection app before surgery. Uh, that's uh, that'll be you know um, I assume there's damage before surgery, so uh, it could also be used as a neuroprotective strategy before that. So definitely, IC100 is uh, for spinal cord injuries. It's, it's on the top of my list. Very good, Robert, Pablo. Okay, can well, I ask a follow up related to that? Yes. So uh, it it seems like it'd be great to have huge quantities of this drug, but I'm wondering to what extent can you manufacture as much as you want so that you could do a trial with this and a trial with that? And a, yeah, and definitely. That, that, yes, uh, uh, hopefully. Yeah, and obviously I'm, I'm being wishy-washy, you know, and uh, this is what I would like. And fortunately, fortunately I know uh, uh, three or, uh, I, know, I know three people more besides me in the, in the scientific advisory board that, that uh, can persuade that towards, you know, a CNS indication. Excellent. So the, the science, the science, because at the end of the day, the, the science uh, should drive us, uh, not just the uh, you know the market share and and all those things. So definitely, uh, it, it would be an uphill battle. Uh, definitely, I've, I've I've considered it, but uh, uh, it's something that you know will will fight for because I mean, when you tell me we we can do this clinical trial here with uh, uh, with uh, world renowned uh, uh, people, uh, so I think. Uh, we have a good case to make to, 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 to the company for it. Cool, thanks. Okay, very good. Um, if there are not any more comments, sorry I got started a little bit uh, late, Alan, colleagues, but um, very nice presentation, Pablo. Thank you very much. And My everybody have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>